committee will come to order. We exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers because taxpayers have a right to know that they, what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in this partnership with Citizen Watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people, to bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. I want to thank all our witnesses for being here with us this day. Uh, we will do a, I'll do a quick opening statement, and then uh, my friend and colleague and ranking member, uh, Mr. Kucinich, will have an opening statement, and then we will get right to your testimony. We do have um, the Australian Prime Minister on the floor at 11, so we'll, we want to get through as much as we can prior to uh, adjourning for, uh, for that. Thank you all for coming today. Last month, the Oversight and Government Reform Committee held a hearing entitled Regulatory Impediments to Job Creation. This hearing was the result of a committee effort to learn about which regulations were standing in the way of job creation. We heard from many employees, excuse me, employers and industries from across the nation. As chairman of this subcommittee, uh, I am especially looking forward to continue this work examining the effects of regulations on American job creators. This subcommittee has jurisdiction over the regulatory process, and we recognize that job creators do not live in a world where they are only subject to one regulation issued by one agency. In the real world, outside the Beltway, job creators are subject to numerous regulations and compliance obligations enforced by a virtual alphabet soup of Federal agencies. As we attempt to get our economy going again and get people back to work, it is crucial that we all start to think about the numerous burdens and mandates that we are putting on the private sector. On January 21, 2011, President Obama issued Executive Order 13563 directing agencies to, quote, take into account the cost of cumulative regulations. I applaud this common sense plan. Today's hearing will examine whether the government has begun to follow this directive and what Congress can do to help implement it. I believe we should start by first looking at the bedrock of our economy, the manufacturing sector. U.S. manufacturing is the industry hit the hardest by regulatory cost, with per firm cost at approximately $688,000, half a million dollars greater than the national average cost for other industries. Moreover, small manufacturers bear a proportionally larger regulatory burden with an estimated cost of $26,000 per, per employee, more than double the burden that is faced by larger manufacturers. While the Oversight Committee was collecting information from job creators about the regulatory burdens they faced, it quickly became obvious which agency was the number one concern to them, the Environmental Protection Agency. This hearing will provide Congress with an opportunity to understand how all the regulations in the pipeline at EPA, in addition to the ones already in existence, impact a critically important part of our economy. I would like to take a moment to say how disappointed I am that the EPA chose not to send a witness to this hearing. The reason given was that their witness would not be scheduled to testify alone on the first panel. I think this subcommittee has been very fair in offering to seat their witness alone on a second panel that would be guaranteed to start at 1030, sharp this morning. However, that offer was rejected. It is too bad that the EPA not only refuses to sit at a witness table with some of the very people that they are regulating, but also refuse to wait and listen to the rest of the witnesses' testimony. Also, in contrast to the EPA, our other witnesses here today have agreed to take time out of their schedules and provide their testimony to us without a list of demands. EPA's behavior is the type that gives people throughout the country the impression that their government is aloof and not listening to them. Despite, despite EPA's lack of participation, I still think we can have a productive and informative hearing. The panel we have here today can speak very well to the cumulative impact of government regulations. This information, straight from the people affected, is invaluable. In fact, the committee even has a website, AmericanJobCreators.com, where any American can log in and tell us their story. We are listening and we want to hear what you have to say. With that, I would yield five minutes to the ranking member, Mr. Kucinich. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And the Chair and I have had discussions about uh, the witnesses, and I am hopeful that in the future we will be able to uh, work out our differences with a common sense approach. I, there, I want to state for the record there is a longstanding precedent in Congress of putting administration witnesses first on their own panel. And there have been exceptions, but uh, the committee has allowed witnesses from Republican and Democratic administration to testify first on their own panel. Now, I uh, certainly respect the prerogative of uh, this chair, and I respect the prerogative of the chair of the full committee. Uh, but, and we don't need to be at loggerheads about things like the sequence of witnesses. We have things that are much uh, more serious to get into here. 
And I, I have every confidence, uh, given our relationship, Mr. Chairman, that we will work it out down the line. I want to thank you for holding the hearing. I, I fully support Would the gentleman yield for Of course I will. Just for 10 seconds. Uh, the gentleman is right. The, the precedence has, has, has been for the administration to have the first panel witness. We thought, in light of the economic situation, in light of the concern we all have, regardless of party, uh, about the regulatory burden, that it made sense to hear from the people who face these regulations and then have the administration have their complete panel to themselves talk and then follow it back up with the same people. We thought that would be a better way for members of Congress and the public to get information. That is why we chose the approach we did. As I indicated, unfortunately, the EPA decided not to send a witness. Well, uh, again, Mr. Chairman, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, if you and I had, had an opportunity <laughs> prior to this moment right here to work this out, I think we probably could have found a way to get the EPA participating. Uh, I certainly uh, think that it is a good idea for them to hear witnesses testify, particularly those who are subject to the EPA regulations. It makes sense. It can actually help you be a better regulator to hear what people have to say. Um, I fully support having a discussion about the impact of regulations on industry, and I want to know if there are regulations that are unnecessarily burdensome on this country's manufacturers. I also uh, know that regulations are creating jobs and the regulations are saving lives. And in order to have a truly productive conversation about regulations that yield real results, we cannot focus solely on costs. The costs must be weighed against benefits. This year, the Office of Management and Budget estimated that from 2000 to 2010, Federal regulations resulted in a financial benefit of $136 billion to $651 billion, with a cost of $44 billion to $62 billion. It is a two-to-one benefit-to-cost ratio using OMB's lowest estimations and greater than a ten-to-one benefit-to-cost ratio based on OMB's highest estimations. EPA's air pollution rules alone account for 60 to 85 percent of these benefits. That means that in the 10-year period from 2000 to 2010, during both a Democrat and Republican uh, White House, EPA regulations have resulted in anywhere from 81 $0.7 billion in benefits to a remarkable $550.4 billion in benefits. These kind of regulations also have a positive effect on job creation. A 2008 study found that environmental protection as an industry generated $300 billion in sales in 2003 and provided 5 million jobs. Many of the regulations identified as burdensome by today's witnesses fall under the umbrella of the Clean Air Act. I think that we are going to hear a lot today about the cost of the Clean Air Act. So I want to take a minute to talk about its benefits. EPA's most recent estimate of the total financial benefit of the Clean Air Act is $1.3 trillion. This figure dwarfs the estimated cost of $53 billion. That is a ratio of about 26 to 1. By 2020, the financial benefit of the Clean Air Act is expected to skyrocket to an astounding $2 trillion, while the proportion of costs increases marginally to $65 billion, a ratio of 32 to 1. In this same report, the EPA uh, went on to say, it is extremely unlikely the cost of the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments uh, programs would exceed their benefits under any reasonable combination of alternative assumptions or methods, even if one were to adopt the extreme assumption that air pollution has no effect on premature mortality or that avoiding such effects has no value. In 2003 alone, EPA estimates that the Clean Air Act standards on only particulate matter and ozone pollution have prevented 160,000 premature deaths, 130,000 cases of acute myocardial infarction, 1.7 million cases of asthma exacerbation, 86,000 hospital admissions, 86,000 emergency room visits, 3.2 million lost school days and 13 million lost work days. We don't want to emulate what is happening in India and China. We don't want to turn the clock back to the 19th century when the absence of regulation led to pollution of our air and water, exploitation of our natural resources, and destruction of our environment. So, Mr. Chairman, as we uh, sit here today and talk about the impact of regulations, let's be careful not to forget that premature deaths, heart attack, asthma, lost school days, and lost work days are also results that we want to avoid. I thank the Chair. I thank the gentleman. Um, our uh, ranking, uh, ranking member of the full committee, gentleman, distinguished gentleman from Maryland, um, would like to make an opening. Very, <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your courtesy. Uh, Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Kucinich, uh, this is a very important hearing. At last month's full committee hearing on the impact of regulations 
on job creation, I said in my opening remarks that effective regulatory review should include several elements, an examination of the costs and benefits, conclusions based on solid data and input from a variety of sources. I support a comprehensive review of the impact of regulations, but I stand firm in my belief that any assessment of, of cumulative impact must take into account the benefits of those regulations and not just the costs. We are better than that. I am also mindful that there are costs associated with the lack of regulation as well. The 2008 financial collapse and subsequent loss of 8 million jobs taught us that much. As a matter of fact, I just held a hearing in my district, this committee held a hearing in my district yesterday where we have seen a loss in Baltimore City of $1.5 billion in, uh, with regard to real estate and foreclosures uh, because of this financial collapse, lack of regulation. At a time when creating jobs in our, uh, is our top priority here in Congress, I believe we must consider that regulation has the potential to actually create jobs, as Mr. Kucinich just said. A February 2011 report issued by the Sirius and the Political Economic Research Institute concluded that EPA's Clean Air, Transport and the Boiler uh, MACT rules will strengthen our economy and grow jobs. Specifically, the report estimates that over the next five years, 1.5 million jobs will be both directly and indirectly created by these two rules. This includes jobs in steel manufacturing, ca manufacturing, catalyst system manufacturing, and control system manufacturing. This is in addition to the substantial public health benefits from cleaner air. EPA estimates that the benefits of the Clean Air Act are projected to exceed the cost by a factor of more than 30 to 1 by 2020. I am reminded when I talk about this of when I worked as a, a high school student at Bethlehem Steel, and uh, when you would go on the yard of Bethlehem Steel, if you blew your nose, what came out was red or black after being there for an hour. Thank God some OSHA rules have come about where you now have to wear masks because people want to go to work, they want jobs, but they want to come home safely to their families and not be shipped to them in a coffin. In November, 20, in November 2010, the World Resources Institute, Institute concluded that EPA's greenhouse gas rules will drive innovation and lead to energy savings for manufacturers. The Institute found that for, for refineries, glass manufacturers and others, investments in efficiency technologies would offset most, if not all, current environmental costs combined. In December 2010, several business organizations representing 60,000 firms across the country wrote to President Obama and members of Congress urging us to support the EPA and the Clean Air Act. In addition, in a December Wall Street Journal letter to the editor titled, We are okay with the EPA's new air quality regulations, eight leading utility companies explain that EPA air quality regulations carry economic benefits, including job creation. Finally, Mr. Chairman, I continue to hope that we will conduct responsible evaluations of regulations consistent with the President's recent executive order. However, any discussion on the cumulative effect of regulation must include the positive impact regulation has on our economy and on our families and on our constituents and the benefit it holds for individuals and businesses alike. I thank all of our panelists for being here today, and I look forward to hearing from you on how we can improve uh, regulations to make America safer. And I wanted to be very clear, Mr. Chairman, uh, on this side of the aisle, we, do, we are concerned about a balanced approach to this. We realize that there are regulations that are probably outdated, but we must be very, very careful, because regulations were, all, after all, put forth to make sure that the American people's safety, health, safety and welfare are protected. And that includes every single person in this great United States of America. Again, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your courtesy, and I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Um, members have seven days to submit opening statements and extraneous material for the record. We welcome our, our uh, panel of witnesses today. First, we have Ms. Donna Harmon. She is CEO of the American Forest and Paper Association. Mr. Eris Papadopoulos, close, right? That's one of those fun names to say. It's like, like Sheboygan, like you know, one of those fun names to say. Uh, he's the CEO and Chairman of Portland Cement Association. We appreciate you being with us today. Mr. Michael Walls is the Vice President of Regulatory and Technical Affairs for the American Chemistry Council. Mr. Michael Kemnikar, 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 excuse me, is Senior Vice President of Marketing and Business Development, incoming President of the Forging Industry Association. And Mr. Terry Schimmel is Vice President of the Technical Service 
at Boral Bricks, uh, Incorporated. And David Forder is the Executive Director of the Institute of Clean Air Companies. It is the uh, practice of the committee to swear all witnesses in, so if you please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to affirm that the testimony you are about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Thank you. And you can be seated. Um, in order to allow for time to, for discussion, uh, we would like for you to limit your comments to uh, five minutes. There's, uh, there should be some lights somewhere that you can see. Do we have those? Mm -hmm. I, don't know where, I don't know where our lighting system is. I will we'll, give you a little, little tap or something. We have it, but I don't know. You, you got it right in front of you, in front of your thing. Okay, we can't see what your names are. Okay, great. So you, you, you know when it gets close, it's sort of like the traffic signals we're all used to. Um, so now let's, let's recognize Ms. Harmon for uh, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you and with the other members of the subcommittee. Uh, my name is Donna Harmon. I am the President and CEO of the American Forest and Paper Association. And the issue that you have brought before us today uh, to look at the challenges presented by the cumulative impact of EPA regulations on manufacturers is, in our view, very timely and uh, extremely important. Many of the laws and the now regulations that come from them were enacted decades ago, and they have contributed to significant improvements in air and water quality. The forest products manufacturing supply chain is heavily regulated, and we will continue to adapt to well-reasoned regulations that are both affordable and achievable. But we cannot respond to regulations in a vacuum. Businesses in our sector must consider the global competitive environment in which they operate. They must compete for capital globally, and they need to have the time to build new regulatory requirements into their capital planning process. They must also be able to rely on government so once a regulation is in place, it will not be selectively enforced or changed within a short time frame. Paper and wood products manufacturers are facing over 20 major regulations from EPA's Clean Air Act program alone. The pace and volume of regulation is not sustainable for the agency the States or the companies that are required to meet them, or the Congress whose obligation it is to provide oversight. I would like to call your attention to the chart that was included with my testimony and on the screen uh, that gives you just an idea of the regulations that are currently under the Clean Air Act in the pipeline that affect the forest products industry. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Do you have a copy of that so we could look at it? We will we'll provide copies for all, uh, all members. Thank you. And it, I believe it was attached to my, uh, to my testimony as well. Okay. The forest products industry, like many other manufacturing industries, has been hit hard by the economic crisis. Since 2006, when the housing and economic crisis began, the forest products industry has lost 31 percent of its, its workforce, nearly 400,000 high-paying jobs largely in small rural communities that can barely afford to lose them. The closure of a mill in a rural community is in a small town has an enormous ripple effect. When that mill is the largest employer and a major contributor to the local tax base and to the community programs, in many cases without these facilities, these communities die. Government regulations that are not cost effective can exacerbate what is already a bad situation. AFMPA recently commissioned a study by Fisher International to assess the jobs impact of the cumulative burden of the largest pending and expected EPA regulations. The study concluded that several upcoming clean air rules would cause 62 mills to close and result in a direct loss of nearly 27,000 paper industry jobs. If supplier jobs and jobs associated with the respending of worker incomes are included, the total job losses would reach nearly 114,000. These results did not even include the Boilermact rule, which I would like to talk about now. Boilermact is just one of many rules adding to the cumulative burden. EPA's Boilermact rule will require more than 90 percent of boilers to make significant changes. And these changes are on top of the changes and the capital they previously invested during the past decade to comply with the 2004 Boilermact rule. For the forest products industry alone, our initial estimate of the capital cost of the final rule is about $3 billion and $11 billion for all manufacturing, plus the operating costs. Unfortunately, as our technical experts delve deeper, their concerns about achievability and cost have grown. For example, the carbon monoxide limits for some biomass boilers actually became more stringent. 
burning wet biomass will be particularly challenging, even with the combustion improvements EPA assumes necessary to meet the more stringent requirements. While Congress authorized EPA to adopt health-based approach, they, they refused, they determined that uh, they would not do so in the rule that was just recently released. We believe if they were to do that, that we could reduce the capital cost required to meet this rule without any impact on human health. Uh, I want to, want to just in my remaining time uh, mention two other rules, the Pulp and Paper MACT and Residual Risk Rules. The Pulp and Paper MACT rule is, a, is intended to be a one-time rule. EPA concluded that rule about 10 years ago. We have implemented that rule. We have made significant changes and gotten a lot of environmental improvement as a result of it. Now they are talking about a redo. That is an example of of the agency going further than is necessary, over-regulating and over-controlling when it is not necessary to protect health. The last rule I would like to mention briefly is the Na National Ambient Air Quality Standards. I think others will also mention this rule. This rule is another rule that collectively will cost the forest products industry alone over $8 billion. Your look at these and other rules today is critically important because jobs are at stake. Investment in making our facilities internationally competitive and securing their future is really what is at stake. So thank you for taking the time to delve into and understand these issues, and I would love to answer your questions as follow-up after the other witnesses. Sure. Thank you, Ms. Harmon. Mr. Papadopoulos. Mr. Chairman and Congressional <laughs> Committee members, my name is Eris Papadopoulos. I serve as CEO of Titan America, a heavy construction material producer in eight states employing over 2,000 Americans. I presently chair the Portland Cement Association that represents 97 percent of U.S. cement capacity with nearly 100 manufacturing plants in 36 states and distribution in all 50. Cement is to concrete what nails are to wood. Without it, our bridges, roads, dams, schools and hospitals will be rubbles of rock. At $6.5 billion combined revenue, we are a relatively small industry. But without us, the entire trillion-dollar construction economy would come to a halt. Without cement, our already deteriorating infrastructure would degrade to unsafe levels along with our communities and quality of life. The Great Recession has hit our industry very hard. Cement demand has dropped in half. Profitability has been wiped out. Yet we sought neither handouts nor bailouts. We cut costs, which sadly included more than 4,000 jobs. What remain are 15,000 well-paying jobs with average compensation of $75,000 and a high representation of minorities. But today these jobs are in jeopardy, and the spillover could affect millions employed in the construction sector. Not only did the Stimulus Act fail to raise construction demand, but at our weakest moment, this government's EPA, whose budget, by the way, was enriched 33 percent through the same act, launched an unprecedented regulatory attack against our industry. This is not a static, but a dynamic industry. In its century-long history, cement manufacturers have demonstrated their commitment to continuous improvement and environmental stewardship. In the decade prior to this recession, it invested tens of billions of dollars in modernizing and expanding facilities with state-of-the-art technology that were win-win for both economics and environment. Today, our industry is one of the largest recyclers of industrial and urban byproducts that would otherwise be landfilled. Yet the current EPA has switched from win-win to win-lose. There should be no doubt that win-lose will lead to lose-lose. Other strategic materials, such as rare earths, once a vital U.S. industry but now controlled by China, are living proof that overregulation leads to offshoring. This is not a choice between environment and economy because the two go hand in hand. And when economic vitality suffers, so does environmental sustainability. Without strategic materials like cement, economic vitality cannot be sustained. Without time to get technical, I would like to note that for one compound, mercury, EPA imposed standards 5 to 12 times stricter than those in Germany. The irony is that this rule won't even help the environment, as 80 percent of the mercury found in the U.S. originates from offshore. EPA has justified these rules with incomprehensible computer models, but they lack any empirical proof or field evidence. 
Our economic study of EPA's rules concludes that two rules alone impose a compliance burden of $5.4 billion in the next four year, years, equal to 85 percent of this industry's annual, total annual sales. They also increase production costs by 20 percent. One rule, NESHAP, will force almost 20 percent of U.S. plants to shut down in three years. The industry could lose 25 percent or an additional 4,000 jobs by 2015. Assuming economic recovery through 2025, this reduced domestic cement capacity will force the U.S. to depend on foreign imports for 56 percent of its needs. We conclude that in totality, these rules make investing in the U.S. unattractive compared to overseas. In the end, neither the economy nor the environment win. American jobs and investment are lost. The same admittance reach Americans in even greater quantities from offshore. Dependence on foreign cement follows the road of dependence on foreign energy. And with, more, and with cement more cumbersome to import than oil, shortages and price volatility will become more common. This could hurt the entire construction economy with impacts on infrastructure, housing, commerce, and job. This industry is committed to its longstanding spirit and practice of continuous improvement and environmental stewardship. But we need a government that we can work with in a win-win constructive manner. Unfortunately, we feel that industries like ours are getting caught in the crossfire of the major assault against coal by global warming forces in this country. Immediate action is needed to rescind these regulations when we are in the midst of one of the worst economic crises before they prolong or worsen the harm, and place a near-term moratorium on more rules. Congress needs to step up and take back legislative ownership if we are to revive private sector confidence that will retain and create good jobs for Americans and restore economic prosperity. We also need Congress to undertake broader legislative reform that will return EPA to its original purpose, strengthen standards of justification for rules, consider cross-border economic and environmental impacts, approach industry with win-win rather than win-lose frameworks, objectively inform rather than panic the public, and reduce wasteful environmental litigation. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. I would be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Mr. Walls. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning to you and members of the subcommittee. I am Mike Walls, the Vice President of Regulatory and Technical Affairs at the American Chemistry Council. Earlier this year, both the leadership of this subcommittee and President Obama called for an examination of existing rules to ensure that they don't create an undue burden on American businesses. We strongly support that effort. We believe there is an appropriate role for regulation in encouraging behavior. Efficient and effective regulation can help markets function. Regulation can help address important public policy objectives. But regulations promulgated without an analysis of the impact on the economy and the impact on jobs, including how multiple regulations compound those impacts, can have quite the opposite effect. If manufacturing is to make a significant contribution to economic recovery, including the creation and maintenance of well-paying jobs, it is imperative that we have an accurate understanding of the impact of these proposed regulations. The full regulatory burden on any particular sector can only be known if that cumulative impact is assessed. Now, the lack of cumulative impact assessments is a fundamental shortcoming in the way government agencies develop and evaluate proposed rules. That shortcoming creates regulatory tunnel vision. It puts innovation, investment, and jobs at risk. Now, ACC and its members have a keen interest in getting regulations right. Our industry is arguably America's most highly regulated industry. There is no aspect of chemical manufacture, distribution, use or disposal that isn't regulated by one or more Federal, State or local requirements. Now, while we understand that substantial benefits can flow from regulation, our, un our industry also understands that that very regulation can translate to fewer American jobs, a less competitive economic uh, position, and reduced innovative capacity. Now, a quick example is useful. Our industry stands right now on the cusp of the most significant energy and feedstock development in a generation. The market changes that are occurring as a result of the vast shale gas formations around the country have the potential to put our industry and our economy in a significantly improved global competitive position. The game-changing nature of shale gas can bring billions in new capital investment, thousands of new jobs, 
and more than $100 billion in additional economic output and Federal, State, and local tax revenue, just flowing from those shale gas activities and the downstream uses of it. But that game-changing development could be impacted severely if regulatory barriers minimize the ability to capitalize on the opportunity. Now, ACC has analyzed the impact uh, of regulatory burdens across eight major regulatory programs at EPA and at other agencies. Those that suite of regulations alone excuse me, could impose a cumulative burden on our industry of over $15 billion between 2011 and 2020, with undiscounted annualized costs as high as $2.7 billion a year in the out years. Now, we are not saying that those rules collectively or individually would eliminate any potential jobs creating investment. But we are saying that those costs, those burdens are very relevant to the market decisions about where and when investments are made. So the compounding effect of those compliance costs diminish the resources available to make meaningful long-term investments that create jobs, promote innovation, and solidify our competitive position. The Federal regulatory uh, process and analysis of regulations can be improved. We would like to see OMB and, e and the individual agencies update their respective economic impact analysis guidance to require cumulative impact of multiple regulatory actions. We would like to see agencies identify and catalog the sectors impacted by a new regulation and even extend that approach into the paperwork burden. Agencies should seek impact from the effect of a regulated community before developing a proposed regulation. It goes to the win-win that is possible from an early engagement so that the public, the government, and the regulated community all benefit. We would also like to see Federal agencies consider the regulatory-induced employment changes as either a cost or a benefit in their assessment and not consider them some indirect cost that is not routinely assessed. Mr. Chairman, ACC supports the efforts to ensure that cumulative impact of Federal regulatory programs is considered as new regulatory requirements are considered. And I will just leave you with one final thought. If our regulatory agencies are capable of assessing the cumulative benefit of their regulatory programs, surely they are capable of assessing the cumulative burden. Thank you. Thank you. Great point. Um, Mr. Kim Nakair. Thank you, Chairman Jordan, ranking members, and members of the subcommittee. Thanks for the opportunity to testify today. I'm Mike Kamnikar of the Elwood Group, and our company produces specialty steel for other forging, forgers and open and closed eye forgeries. I'm also the incoming president of the Forging Industry Association, uh, with operations from member companies in 38 states. The modern forging process is capital intensive, and most forging companies are small businesses. Forging is one of the oldest known metalworking processes where metal is pressed or pounded or squeezed under great pressure to make high performance parts. In a nutshell, nothing that moves on land or in the air or on the sea can move without forgings. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, U.S. manufacturers need a regulatory system that works appropriate regulations that improve health, safety, and the environment are a necessary part of doing business in the U.S. However, when the regulatory process produces new regulations that do not provide additional benefits for the attendant costs and the regulatory community has little to no opportunity to participate in the process, the system is broke. FIA believes there are two overall problems with the re regulatory process. First, there is a lack of understanding of the manufacturing supply chain and the effects of regulations on that supply chain. You cannot build a wind turbine with wind energy. Said another way, you cannot regulate, say, the power, and power generation or automotive industry and not have an effect on the suppliers in that supply chain. Second, there is a lack of transparency and sufficient stakeholder involvement in the regulatory process. When agencies bypass the Administrative Procedures Act or allow only brief public comment periods on complex technical regulatory changes, we get ill-conceived regulations with unintended or unexpected consequences 
and we undermine the integrity and, of the, and the public's confidence in the rulemaking process. Many FIA members are small and rely on the FIA to assess the potential impact of our government action on their operations and to weigh in on their action on our behalf. But the FIA does not have technical experts on all subjects at all times, so we need the time to consult with member companies of all sizes on proposed government regulation, including determining when specialized ex expertise may be needed. I would like to highlight three examples of current uh, and proposed regulations from my written testimony. The first example involves EPI, EPA's regulation of greenhouse gas emissions under the Clean Air Act. Most forging work is done at 2,300 degrees Fahrenheit, and subsequent heat treatment is done at temperatures up to 1,900 degrees F and using natural gas, electric, or induction furnaces. There are no alternative technologies available. EPA's decision to start regulating greenhouse gas emissions with large stationary sources means forgers will only have to worry about the, the potential effect of these regulations on their suppliers. Our company makes steel for the forgers, and we make forgings ourselves. So how much will our, our electricity costs rise, uh, and, and what will be the effect on other raw materials? When suppliers are regulated, we are very concerned that we will be pushed into a regulatory system merely because we use natural gas or make critical components. The second example involves an EPA proposal for metalworking facilities to be considered in the development of the financial responsibility requirements under the Superfund law. The proposal also required that the entire metalworking industry be examined to determine if they should be subject to these requirements. These types of financial assurance mechanisms for potential Superfund liability can be very expensive and extremely difficult to obtain for most metalworking companies, which are small and medium-sized and pose little risk, and we already carry insurance. Finally, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the forging industry's concern with OSHA's recent proposal to reinterpret the definition of feasible as it related to energy, engineering and administration administrative controls to reduce overall workplace in the, uh, noise in the workplace. Fortunately, uh, as we know, th that was uh, withdrawn. Uh, lastly, it is critically important that we regulate only that which requires regulation and only after a thorough vetting of the potential benefits, impacts, and costs of that regulation. Thank you, Mr. Thank Cam Nakar. We appreciate that. Uh, we are also pleased to be joined by the uh, Chairman of the Full Committee, Mr. Issa. Pleasure having you with us today, Mr. Uh, Mr. Schimmel. Good morning, Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Kucinich, and Subcommittee members. Thank you for the privilege of testifying about the cumulative impact <clears throat> of regulation on a small, essentially U.S. industry, the clay brick industry. My name is Terry Schimmel, and I'm Vice President of Technical Services at Borough Bricks. Borough is one of the largest brick manufacturers with 22 manufacturing plants and 55 distribution centers across 11 states. I have been in brick business for 39 years, and my responsibilities include oversight of emission control equipment for Borough's U.S. plants and compliance with environmental health and safety regulations. Borough's energy efficient brick kills have reduced energy usage 15 percent over the past five years. It is only one example of our commitment to environmental stewardship. We take these steps voluntarily without government mandates, but we are concerned about future viability given the tremendous hit the industry has taken and the rising number of regulations. At full production, Boral employs approximately 2,000 Americans. Today, nearly 1,100 of Boral's U.S. jobs, or 55 percent, have been temporarily or permanently lost due to the construction recession. According to the most recent census, brick production nationwide has dropped 66 percent since 2005, reaching the lowest level in three decades. Approximately 9,000 direct brick manufacturing jobs and 86,000 indirect brick jobs have been lost since 2006. Brick industry business is only very slowly beginning to pick up, but there is no end to the escalation of cost of doing business due to the regulations that provide no commensurate benefit to the environment, health, and safety. We believe responsible, reasonable regulation <coughs> can be developed to protect both environmental and health. But the number of rulemakings in the pipeline and their anticipated mandates jeopardize brick jobs in our recovery. 
Our greatest concern, EPA is currently redeveloping a maximum achievable control technology rule for the clay, brick, and tile. The key word is redeveloping, as the industry recently spent more than $100 million in capital cost alone to come in compliance with the original Act rule that was finalized in 2003. Pearl spent more than $12 million to install mandated control devices to meet the 2006 compliance date. While the U.S. District Court vacated the original MAC rule in 2007, more than a year after the compliance date, most states continue to enforce MAC limits as part of existing Title V permits. The result is that the brick industry has spent approximately $170 million in cumulative ongoing compliance costs for these controls since 2002 due to the now vacated MAC. EPA now is using the reduced emission levels achieved by kills with control devices installed by the, for the vacated rule to calculate an even more stringent baseline of all kills. The technology to meet the final standard may not even exist if EPA cherry picks data to establish a standard that no real world brick kill has actually achieved. <coughs> EPA's cost estimate of a revised MAC is approximately $188 million per year, a staggering 20 percent cost to sales ratio for one rule. Congress provided flexibility in the Clean Air Act to allow reasonable rules. As Portland brick industry continued to work with the APA, we appreciate the agency's willingness to discuss health-based compliance approach. We are hope hopeful it could ensure that controls are installed when needed to protect the environment rather than mandated controls that are unnecessary due to an imperfect database. EPA could use its discretion under the Clean Air Act to find alternative solutions to avoid unnecessary job loss and expenditures that provide little to no benefit to the environment. Our second big concern is OSHA's proposed crystalline silica rule that is expected to substantially decrease the permissible exposure limit across general industry. Worker safety is vitally important to Borel. However, decades of scientific studies demonstrate that the risk from exposure to silica from quartz and brick clays and shales are not the same as risk from quartz used in other industrial settings. Silicose is cost by Crystalline silica is essentially nonexistent brick manufacturing workers. But because OSHA undertook the peer review process without providing an opportunity for industry input, this brick specific evidence may not be reflected in the proposed rule. The current PEL protects brick workers, and any reduction for, for the brick manufacturing industry would impose cost burdens for non demonstrated health benefits. These just two issues alone could overwhelm the industry. Taken together with EPA's greenhouse gas regulations, however, could encompass numerous brick kills in the, on, in the coming years, and its tightening of national ambient air quality standards, the burden is unsustainable. Given the important progress the Federal agencies have helped guide to, to protect the environment and safety, future steps should independently demonstrate reasonable cost for potential improvements. Congressional oversight should ensure maximum benefit per dollar invested for the regulatory compliance to prevent small, historical U.S. industries like brick from being regulated out of existence. Thank you, and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Schimmel. Mr. Porter. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, uh, for the invitation to share another industry perspective on the hearing on how regulations and requirements create real jobs in the American economy. I am David Porter, the Executive Director of the Institute of Clean Air Companies, or so commonly called ICAC. Today, I would like to briefly highlight the fact that investments and efforts to clean the air we breathe creates real jobs for the real people in the U.S. economy, and it saves lives. In these brief comments, I hope to impart a few realities and a perspective from a mature you know, manufacturing in industry. For more than 50 years, the Institute has been the nonprofit National Trade Association of Companies, working to equip stationary sources and generally power and large industrial facilities with air pollution control and measurement technologies. The Institute's members uh, count to about 100 companies, leading manufacturers in, in both measurement and control. We believe, and history affirms, that equipping these sources ensures industrial progress while cleaning the air we breathe. Here are a few realities I would like to highlight today. We know that investments in clean air technologies result in substantial returns and avoided health costs for the American public. We know that these same investments are plowed back into the U.S. economy as real jobs in my industry and many related industries. We know that many of the business interests testifying at these hearings also provide materials that are used in the manufacturing equipment for the air pollution control industry, and as such, there is a need and desire to work towards sustainable solutions. I find that these realities can be distilled down to a rather simple formula. The Clean Air Act spurs investments which create jobs, improved health, and a modernized and more sustainable fleet. 
The formula has worked well for 40 years, and this is something we need now more than ever. The principal function of the, the clean air requirements is the clean air we breathe. We therefore are heartened that a renewed interest in, in jobs and a, has reintroduced one of the most amazing aspects of air pollution control technologies. Simply, for every dollar spent, as much as $40 Of the Clean Air Act, the technology innovations of our industry and the combined efforts of industries to clean the air while ensuring industrial progress. It is important not to lose focus on the safeguards are there to cl create cleaner air for all of us, helping save lives and avoid to reduce illness. Fortunately, these safeguards are a win-win. To comply with them, companies will need to undertake construction projects. That means jobs in areas that are currently facing challenging times. The clean air investments spurred by regulation requirements create real jobs while satisfying their principal goal of healthy air. Most air pollution equipment for large sources is constructed or fabricated on site, requires high levels of engineering and design, labor, and depends on component equipment and materials. This means jobs for skilled craft labor, such as boilermakers, and new upstream and downstream employment and economic benefits for a variety of industries and communities where they are located. For example, building this equipment requires construction materials such as steel plate, steel alloy steel, fabricated steel components, structural steel and concrete. In addition, these projects require engineered equipment and special materials such as slurry pumps, fans, motors and catalysts. And to sustain operation of these systems, reagents such as urea, ammonia, limestone, trona, activated carbon are all needed as well as other consumables such as fabric filters used in particular removal. While the focus of installing controls is on our industry, uh, we rely on many industries and employers to get the job done. And that is just what we have been doing with tremendous success for several decades, getting the job done where and when needed most. As an industry, ICAC offers constructive comment on almost every major um, requirement that is out there. And uh, these comments are part of the public record and they demonstrate what we believe is, is constructive insight in how industries can, can make changes and still uh, serve industrial progress. The, a similar story exists for industrial sources where we are looking at uh, the Clean Air Act spurs investments which create jobs, improve health and modernize the fleet. We are at a juncture where necessary upgrades are long overdue and the experienced workforce is fully available to complete the effort. In addition, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency finalized the rule for industrial boilermakers sector that is significantly less stringent and at a lower cost than proposed last year. This is something we need now to get America back on the job and protect public health. The reality is that my industry works constructively to help other industries comply with regulatory requirements. We are highly competitive and we are looking at many technology solutions, not just one, often offering a suite of solutions. In closing, in President Obama's executive order on January 18th, Characterize a regulatory system that protects public health, welfare, safety, and the environment while promoting economic growth, innovation, competitiveness, and job creation. I hope that has been clear. This is a shared vision within my industry, where for more than 50 years the members have existed, prospered, innovated, and made significant contribution to the health of the U.S. economy. I look forward to continued efforts that create real jobs for real people and real health benefits. Thank you, Mr. Forcher. If we, uh, if we all stick to our five minutes, I think we can all get around the question before the joint, sessions, uh, before the joint session. Mr. Kamnikar, you mentioned in your testimony many of the, your members of your association are small business owners. Um, in our previous full committee hearing, we had a number of small business owners in here. And one of our, our, I believe, freshman members asked what I thought was just the, the most compelling question. Um, they asked each of those small business owners, if you knew then what you know now, would you have started? And it was amazing to me that every single witness that day said they would not have started their business if they, if they knew then what they are faced with now uh, on the regulatory front. So tell me, was, was that an anomaly or is that, would that be consistent with the members in your respective associations? And we will start with Mr. Kamnikar. Yeah, I would say that that is an accurate uh, uh, assessment. M most of our small member uh, companies are family owned, third, fourth generation. So when the businesses got established, it was quite different than it mm -hmm. is today. Ms. Harmon? 
many of our businesses do, our small businesses. We also represent large businesses sure, who have uh, sure. been in business for over, over 100 years. I think the most uh, striking thing that they would tell you that is the most difficult is that they begin a project or a proposal under one set of rules only to have those rules later changed. Boiler Mact is an excellent example where they invested millions of dollars to mm -hmm. comply with the 2004 rule now and complied with that by the deadline of 2007, only to find now that they have to invest another $3 billion, $3 billion you know, a mere few years later, four years later. It is not sustainable. And they would tell you that it has a real impact on their capital decisions, whether to invest that capital here, invest it overseas, or not invest at all. And the not investing it at all is probably the biggest economic and environmental problem that we face today. Before we go to Mr. Papadopoulos, let, let me, you, you made me think about what, we have this website, American Job Creators, and we have several responses from, from our State, uh, the ranking member, uh, and, and, and I have the privilege of representing folks in Ohio. And one comes to us from a gentleman from Menor, Ohio, close to Mr. Kucinich's district. He said, uh, he has a quote, he says, A wise man once told me that the human mind can accept good news, can accommodate bad news, but can never get comfortable with uncertainty. And uh, that is a huge impediment. And I think in, in your testimony, uh, Mr. Papadopoulos, you, you talked about Congress reclaiming its responsibility over this area. So talk to me a little bit more about the uncertainty. And the first question I ask, do, do your members and your association would they echo what um, others have said, that if they knew then what they know now, they wouldn't have started their business? That, Congressman, first by talking about myself, because over the last 20 years, I have encouraged and sold to my own parent company to invest in the U.S., and it has been $1 to $2 billion. Mm. And I find it very difficult today to make that argument. You know, it's, you know uh, I heard from Mr. Forder talk about win-win, but win-win for who? Win-win for the company selling this, this equipment? Yes, this uh, you know, control equipment. Win-win for the environmental activists? But what about win-win for the companies that have to gain a return on investment? I don't see that in today's U.S. environment. And it sa saddens me as an American citizen more than anything else. I see other countries getting ahead of us. I see we have world-class companies here in the U.S. We have the best environment here in the U.S. We breathe the best air. And yet we are pushing our own world-class companies to the brink. You know, we are not going to be breathing our own air. We are going to be breathing other countries' air the way we are going, without the jobs, without the investment. Mm -hmm. That is, to me, the sad big picture. And I have difficulty convincing to, in today's world, today's environment, why the U.S. is the best place to keep pouring money with this uh, regulatory and, and, you know, situation. Mr. Walls. Mr. Chairman, uh, um, our, our, the member companies of the American Chemistry Council operate in a globally right. very intensely competitive industry. Um, it is that regulatory uncertainty that is the primary determinant in whether or not they are making investments here or elsewhere around the world. I will just take, go back to my example on yeah, shale gas. Shale gas, right. That, you know, uh, that uh, again, is, a, is the type of game-changing development here that is going to make us more competitive. We have got uh, folks in our industry saying that this development alone could put a whole new lease on life in this industry. Um, we want to capitalize on that opportunity and reduce the uncertainties that are out there. Right. Mr. Simmel, I apologize. You got 15 seconds because I we got to stick to the five minutes so everyone gets in. Uh, I guess answer to your question, uh, Boral, of course, is internationally traded, and right. we have a responsibility to return shareholder value. And I would think that uh, were they to make additional acquisitions in the United States, they would have to think twice about the regulatory burden imposed uh, by, by these rules. Yeah. Recognize the ranking member, Mr. Kucinich. Thank you, very, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I was listening to uh, Ms. Harmon's testimony uh, on how the industry has to consider Global competitive, the global competitive environment. And I had a visit a couple of weeks ago from the Pulp and Paper Workers Resource Council, and they provided me with uh, a lot of information that would be interesting for this committee, and I am going to submit it. It shows the, uh, this is a chart here that shows the um, closed sawmills and paper mills, uh, 1989 to 2003. Most of, most of them um, uh, after uh, 93, I might mention, and also shows the closed sawmills and paper mills 2004 to 2007. Uh, and as I, I look at all these closures, pretty stunning. Then they showed me a map 
of, of how many have gone to other countries, uh, notably China. Okay? Now, it's a very interesting point here when I'm listening to this discussion, because I think, I, I think you're, you're mentioning one part of the equation, but it's only, frankly, a small part of the equation, because we're looking at trade agreements that were absent workers' rights, the right to organize, right to collective bargaining, right to strike, right to decent wages and benefits, human rights, prohibitions on child labor, slave labor, prison labor, and environmental quality principles, uh, protection of air and water. Those weren't in our trade agreements in NAFTA, and we look at the U.S. paper mill shutdowns, we see how many shutdowns occurred right after NAFTA, and then after China trade, the shutdowns skyrocketed. Now, I'm going to submit this for the record, because I, I think that uh, thank you. I think that, uh, well, you have to consider the global competitive environment. We certainly don't want our air quality standards or our labor standards to be reduced to a point where we become like countries that are less democratic, because in order to have a political democracy, you have to have an economic democracy. I also want to put to the record uh, a news story out of The Guardian, U.K., which shows that China, China, this is last year, ordered polluting and unsafe factories shut down including, I might add, in China, they shut down some of their uh, older paper mills, 279 to be exact, because the Premier of China was concerned about making sure the energy efficiency of all of his industries could be increased. So China gets the connection now between upgrading and energy efficiency, and that also means paying attention to the environment. So for the record. Now, Mr. F uh, uh, Forder. Uh, I wanted to ask you, in your written testimony, you state that each dollar spent on air pollution control technologies produces $40 in health savings. Can you explain how that occurs? It, the, uh, the, the types of pollutants that we are talking about in many cases are going to be uh, sulfur dioxide, oxi ox oxides of nitrogen. Uh, sulfur dioxide is, you know, when we are looking at acid rain program, that is the big uh, pollutant in that group. The oxides of nitrogen, that is for ozone trans transport and ozone, which gets into the lungs. The others are these hazardous air pollutants, which are a lot of metals that come from that. So even though I think look in the, the most recent uh, Industrial Boiler Act, those numbers come up to be very close to that, that $40. Well, so you are telling us that uh, EPA regulations actually create jobs and support industry. The figures I have seen from OMB, from the EPA, and from numerous private studies support your claims that environmental protections, like the Clean Air Act, have a positive impact on the economy. In fact, a 2008 study from the Journal of Environmental Management entitled Environmental Protection, the Economy and Jobs, National and Regional Analyses states that, quote, contrary to general public perception and public policy understanding since the late 1960s, protection of the environment has grown rapidly to become a major sales generating, profit making, job creating industry. Mr. Forder, is that uh, assessment consistent with what you have observed? That is correct. Uh, the, 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 co the cost of controls are much less. Uh, they, in fact, when we actually do the implementation of the rules, they often are much less than they are even projected in the EPA rule makings. Well, the authors of that 2008 study state that environmental protection as an industry generated $300 billion per year in sales in 2003, created 5 million jobs. The authors went on to state, quote, most of the 5 million jobs created are standard jobs for accountants, engineers, and computer analysts, clerks, factory workers, and the classic environmental job, environmental engineer, ecologists, et cetera. It constitutes only a small portion of the jobs created. Most of the persons employed in these jobs created may not even realize that they owe their livelihood to protecting the environment. Uh, Mr. F Forder, that uh, sounds good, and it sounds like good, well-paying, middle-class jobs. Are these the kind of jobs that you have seen created in the industry? These are. We are talking about companies that actually do all the IT work, the, the financial investments. I mean, we do bidding on the, on the projects, as well as going into the engineer and design, which are some of the ones I talked about in my testimony. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kucinich. I, I guess I will yield myself five minutes. Um, good morning to all of you and welcome. Uh, first, I want to thank Mr. Chairman for uh, holding this particularly timely meeting as we um, make jobs and the economy a priority here in this Congress, what is becoming more and more apparent to us, and I am sure you all have recognized this for a long time, is the, the crushing regulations that you all face. And it makes doing business in this country extremely difficult. 
we would like to change that. Our chairman, um, Mr. Issa, has charged us with, with going out and finding out the ways that these regulations are standing in the way of success. And so that is what we are doing here this morning. I think we can all agree that all of these regulations really represent uh, a hidden tax on businesses and the cost of doing businesses. And I would like to get into the cost of compliance in a few minutes. I think that uh, we can agree, it was mentioned earlier, that uh, the stimulus failed because the government can't create jobs. And so I want to thank all of you this morning for being the job creators in our country and for keeping our economy. Uh, you, you all are the ones that can get this economy back on track. So we need to work with you to figure out how we get the government out of your way. Um, I also want to comment that not only have I heard from businesses throughout the hearings that we have conducted, you hear from not-for-profits, you hear from schools, that the cost of these regulations don't even make sense, and it just impairs and impedes their success. So I look forward to hearing from all of you this morning. Um, I guess I want to go back to um, my colleague, Mr. Kucinich's comments about the cost and the cost-benefit. I think I would like to hear from all of you, if you wouldn't mind. Can you just tell me in each of your industries, if you can give me a figure for the cost of compliance, the cost of regulations within your various industries? Ms. Harmon? In multiple billions of dollars. It is between the capital costs plus the operating and maintenance costs that are ongoing. It is not just the cost of initially complying with the regulation. It is the day-in, day-out cost. It is also the cost of projects that can't go forward because they can't make it through the regulatory red tape. A lot of these projects are energy efficiency improvement projects. Some of them are mill modernization projects. They are projects that will secure the future of the mill so that our mills can actually buy the technology that Mr. Forder is talking about. But if those mills close, they can't buy that technology and they can't create those jobs. Thank you. Mr. Papadopoulos? Let me just say from excuse me, the, inter the international experience I have that today it costs in the U.S. in our industry twice as much to build capacity that it does, not in China, I am not using that as a, as a role model, but even in the EU. We have gone to such an extreme in, in that count. So, you know, I, I know we don't want to go back to where we were 30 years ago. That we know. But I think we have reached the point of diminishing returns. We have reached the point where we do have a healthy environment. We do have a world class industry, and we can't accept that. We want to just keep pushing ourselves when others need to catch up with us. Because, as I mentioned before, you know, we are going to be breathing other people's admittance. It is not going to be our own. Thank and, you. And that is something that you know, should occupy us. Mr. Wells? Um, our, our situation is similar to that of the forest and paper industry, in, um, not only in terms of the billions of dollars our industry spends to, in direct compliance costs, but we also experience a number of indirect costs um, a, as a result of those regulatory requirements. One of those indirect costs, frankly, is in jobs. Our industry now employs about 780,000 Americans. That is down from a high of almost a million. Um, in, in the mid-2000s, when natural gas prices spiked over a five-year period, we'd shed, we lost 140,000 jobs. Year on year, between February 2010 to February 2011, we lost another 15,000 jobs. Um, I'm not saying that the regulations themselves are the sole cause of those, of those jobs being lost, but they're one of the impacts we're seeing from the additional regulatory burden being proposed. Boiler Mact is an ex excellent example. In that in the original proposal that came from EPA, they would establish emissions limitations that could not be met by the existing technology. Those, if the technology isn't there to meet the emission limitation, what job is going to be created to create the equipment to then meet the standard? Thank you. Mr. Kamnikar? I made six trips to China and three trips to India in the last five years to benchmark against industries uh, that we compete with. The, the point is, and, and uh, Congressman Kucinich made a, a, a long list of achievements that all of us uh, across the table have achieved in terms of safety and in, in the environment. And if, if we just put a moratorium on where we are at today, it would, it, it would take 20 years, if ever, for the industries in China and India to catch up. Thank you. I apologize, Mr. Schimmel. We are out of time. Uh, I yield back to the Chairman. We will we'll recognize the uh, ranking member. Uh, 
Thank you very much. I want to thank all of you for your outstanding testimony. As I sat here, I could not help but uh, think and go back to something that the Chairman of the Subcommittee said when he was talking about um, that we had some witnesses. And I, Mr. Chairman, forgive me, it may have been another hearing that I was in. I think we are talking about the same hearing. And when people were asked would they start their businesses again, there was one person. The reason why I remember this is because it was just he was the one person who said, you know what, although I am concerned about regulations, I would start my business again because I am so honored to have the opportunities that I have to conduct a business in the United States of America. I will never forget that as long as I live. You know, as I hear the complaints and concerns, I am just, I guess maybe I come from a different world. You know, if you go to, in Baltimore, you look at the obituary page, you know, most people, and as in most places, most people die from one or two things. I read, the first thing I read in the morning is the obituary page. It's either cancer or heart disease. And there are some communities in Baltimore, where I come from, a particular area called Fairfield, where uh, the chemical industry um, had a lot of plants and they were pumping out all kinds of stuff years ago. And there came a point in time when they pretty much said that after years and years of people living in that environment, say, you know, nobody should be living in this environment. And a lot of those people found themselves getting cancer and suffering greatly. And I'm not trying to paint the industry as a, in a negative way. What I'm trying to say, these industries in a negative way, what I'm saying is that we must always have balance. And I, think, and I, I appreciate each and every one of you, I think, uh, each and every, every one of you talked about the fact that uh, there is definitely um, Regulations are important for the safe, healthy, and welfare of our people. Um, and so often, I think we get confused thinking that on this side of the aisle, all we want is regulate, regulate, regulate. No, that's not what we're saying. We're saying that we want to get rid of regulations that make no sense. And I think all of you have made cases for some of those regulations that need to go. But at the same time, we want to make sure that there is balance. When we get away from balance, then we have a problem in this nation. If we get away from balance in our family decisions, we have uh, problems. And that is the key. Um, and one of you, uh, t well, several of you talked about uncertainty. Uncertainty in the United States of America in a democracy, you are going to have uncertainty no matter what you, how you look at it. When you change administrations, you are going to have uncertainty. A lot of the regulations that you are talking about, that you are complaining about, came under a Republican administration, some came under Democrat, uh, uh, folks change uh, because of the, the, that's part of the price that we pay uh, in living in a democracy, uncertainty, changes of policy and what have you. Uh, and so I think we have to, when we look at all of this, we have to ask the question, and I think Mr. Kucinich, uh went hit on it pretty, pretty uh, hard. Um, Somebody said a moment ago that it would take them 20 years. I think it was, who said that? Uh, it's 20 years to catch up with us. I think it was Mr. Kandekar. Yeah, that's true, but we're better than that. This is America. This is the United States of America. We're better than that. And I've seen over and over again, I think we can, when we don't have the balance that I'm talking about, we can get caught up in a culture of mediocrity. And while we think we are ahead of the game, if we get caught up in that culture of mediocrity long enough, we will be, be behind the game. We want our people to have good health. We want people to be able to have safe jobs. I, 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 I want your son, who may want to do like I did and have a tough job at Bethlehem Steel, uh, to be able to go there and when he blows his nose, he doesn't blow out soot. I want that. I want that desperately. At the same time, I want you all to make, a, make the money so that he can have a job. And so that, that's where the balance comes from. There is nobody. We want job creating uh, opportunities. We want it, you all to be successful. But at the same time, we want to safeguard our citizens. Unfortunately, there are a lot of people who don't even know the environments that they are walking into. And so we have to speak for them. If we don't speak for them, nobody else will. 
somebody has to say, wait a minute, let's make sure that these regulations are fair. And so I think the President is right. I think he hit the right balance. I think there have been members on both sides of the aisle who have said the President has hit the right balance. Now what we got to do is we got to go through these regulations, we got to look at them carefully, make sure that industry is able to thrive and survive. But let's keep one thing in mind. We are so fortunate to have companies operating in this country. It is an honor, and as the gentleman said, I didn't say it, he said it. It was an, it's an honor to have the opportunities that we have here. And so I don't want us to take that for granted. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Payne. sorry, Madam Chair. Lady. Thank you. I would like to now recognize uh, the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Mike Kelly. Uh, thank you, ma'am. I am going to yield to Mr. Issa. Uh, I thank the gentleman. I am a little surprised. I uh, will be brief, uh, and I apologize. We have two, two hearings of this committee going on, so I am going back and forth. Um, Mr. Kamakar, uh, I believe that uh, when, when you were talking about the demands to the forging industry, in a sense, isn't the greatest demand by far, the greatest challenge, simply the energy? I mean, when you get past capital cost, isn't, isn't real, doesn't it really boil down to, no matter how in, uh, effectively you use uh, energy, if your competitors in other countries can get their energy source less, significantly less ex, uh, expensively, you will be outgunned in the international market. Isn't that true? It is quite clear. And, and uh, re regulating greenhouse gases in the way that has been outlined uh, will effectively put many of our suppliers and many forgers out of business because the energy, but either electricity or the natural gas, will, will not, it will become cost prohibitive throughout the supply chain. And uh, Mr. Uh, Forter, now I know there is a whole industry of green jobs and green energy and so on, but isn't it true today that if you use green energy, let's just say all of it, by definition, in a, on an unsubsidized basis, you are paying dramatically more for this energy. There is no, quote, alternative energy industry that can provide on an unsubsidized basis competition with the basic, the base fuels of coal, oil, and natural gas. Isn't that true? Well, I, I would be unqualified to talk about renewables like solar and wind, but when it come, what we do is we clean up the, mostly the fossil fuels. So basically we keep coal operating, keep oil natural gas as it comes into the mix. Right. And even after you clean up coal, it is still in the neighborhood of $0.07 cents a, a kilowatt, dramatically less than any of the, uh, if you will, new renewable fuels. Yeah, we have actually seen, you know, while these air pollution control requirements have gone in place for coal-fired utilities, the cost of electricity has actually gone down. So uh, for uh, Mr. Schemmel, uh, it's interesting that you uh, that you're sort of involved in the brick making business because I was in Hanoi some time back, and I got to observe how they make bricks. Now they're totally supportive of Kyoto and all the other protocols. They take pure, just plain coal and they burn it, high sulfur coal, and the leaf, tops of every leaf are black. Literally, you can see your way back a thousand years into how you would make bricks. When we look at the amount of BTUs you use and thus the amount of carbon you put in, even if you were using a source fuel of coal, wouldn't it be true that you probably use 20, one twentieth the fuel that is used in an open hearth type brick production? I would say that is probably approximately correct. Uh, I have been to Malaysia and seen some of the slope kills that you probably are referencing where they burn waste wood. Uh, you know, traditionally in the 70s, the United States brick industry was around 4,000 BTUs a pound. Now we're down to about 1,200. Uh, and in, in Boral, at least, as well as some of our competitors, we use uh, landfill gas, we use wood waste, natural gas, some coal. Uh, but, but yes, the, the industry as a whole has, has changed its technology uh, substantially over the years. And uh, periodic kills, although there are a few of them still in existence, most of them are are automated computer controlled tunnel kills uh, that are highly efficient. So in a, in a sense, every time an American operation shuts down, 
and most overseas locations particularly in a developing world take their place you are going to have more a larger carbon footprint rather than a smaller carbon footprint isn't that what the industry has found I think that is traditionally true. Uh, some of the European technology, of course, is probably on par with where we are, but certainly we go to China and some of those other uh, uh, less uh, uh, energy savvy countries. Well, and you know, it is funny you mentioned Europe because we will be going to France to visit the uh, nuclear reprocessing facility that allows France to have all its entire base load coming from nuclear with zero emissions because they are willing to use a source of fuel that costs less than $0.06 cents a kilowatt hour after all the cost of disposal. So uh, hopefully that will be a lesson learned, is that we should copy the Europeans in at least one item. Well, two if you count dark, dark chocolate. Uh, <laughs> uh, Ms. Harmon, the, uh, the general health of the forest industry in, in North America is considered to be good, but if you take Canada out, how good is it? How good is the ability to get the source material and to work with the pulp in the United States versus Canada versus most of your competitor uh, countries? Well, the U.S. forest products industry is highly competitive, and we are competitive because we have made very difficult decisions, because we have uh, right-sized our business. That means downsizing, unfortunately. EPA rules and regulations have, have uh, been a contributing factor in that. Some of the high energy costs that affected the chemical industry have also affected us. Uh, an interesting uh, comment that you raised earlier about renewable energy, I would offer to you that the forest products industry is one place where on an unsubsidized basis we can produce renewable energy as a byproduct of our manufacturing process, and we can do it very cost effectively. And in fact, it is a large portion of our energy, which is why the biomass rules in the Boiler Act uh, regulation so negatively affect our industry. Well, thank you, and I commend you for that work, and I think we are all well aware that you have been an industry in which nothing goes to waste. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to now uh, yield four minutes to uh, Chairman Issa. <laughs> which I will yield to the gentleman from Pennsylvania. Thank you. I owe, I owe you. Well, I am going to thank the, uh, the gentleman from California for yielding back, and Madam Chairman, thank you. And as we continue to uh, do things the proper way. First of all, I want to thank all of you for being here. I come from the private industry also. And, uh, and there is an old adage that is out there, uh, and it goes something like this, don't worry about the mule, just load the wagon. And I think we are at a point where the mule is about ready to walk away from the harness himself. And it is really great that we are concerned about clean air, and we are concerned about clean water, and we are concerned about the health of our workers. And I would suggest this, that is not just one party is concerned. All of us are concerned about that. It is the cumulative effect of all these regulations. They keep building and building and building to where it is going to break. Now, I am uh, somewhat of, a, of an athlete, not a great one, but one sport that always interested me was golf. And what interests me about golf is a guy like me who is a lousy golfer can beat a guy who is really good. It is called a handicap. Now, we have continued to handicap you, and now I am part of this government, to handicap you and handicap you and handicap you, so I think you are about ready to walk away from the harness. But in particular, first of all, Mr. Mr. Kamnikar, thanks for being here. Uh, in, in the district, you know we have so many people in the business, and, and I want to congratulate you on becoming the president of, of the organization. But the effect of these cumulative regulations, if you could just walk us through, because a lot of us have never signed the front half of a check and have absolutely no idea at the unintended consequences of all these costs, if you could just kind of walk us through, for example, something like ITAR and how difficult it makes it for somebody who makes roll bearings to go through that type of regulation and the cost involved, because at the end of the day, it is the cost that concerns me and our ability to compete in a global market. We have handicapped ourselves to the point where we are forfeiting the ability to, to, to compete, if you could, sir. Excuse me. Um if I could just interrupt, the, the House rules are requiring that we uh, adjourn this meeting. However, if you would like to take 30 seconds to answer Mr. Kelly's question, and then we will adjourn. I, I, it is difficult to answer. Uh, I would simply say this, that and I think this is true of everybody on the panel. We have done a lot to get to where we are today, and uh, 
the uncertainty, the possibility of further regulation is what we are most concerned about. And, and my, I go back to my point about competing with the Chinese and Indians. It, it will take them a very long time to get where we are today, and, but while they continue to operate, they have a very big advantage over us. We will take our chances against them, but let us not regulate us even more. Thank you. Again, I apologize for the time constraints this morning. I would like to thank all of our guests here for taking time out of your busy schedules to appear before us, give us your testimony. Uh, the meeting will stand adjourned. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you being here. Yeah. Yeah. We don't have a chance to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.